Good morning. How are you all doing? So fresh? Not tired? Great. So my name is Dina Barrett. I'm a solution architect at Amazon Web Services, and I'd like to talk to you today about AI. But firstly, I would like to introduce Roland. Come on, Sage. <laughs> I think you're surprised. Go ahead. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. I'm Roland Skyser. I'm the CTO of Viner. Right. Thank you. Um, Roland will be talking about his use case and using artificial intelligence uh, after my section is done. So hopefully you're still around for that. Thank you very much. Okay. So how many here know a little bit about AI? Hands up. How many here are experts in AI? One person. Okay. All right. All right. Good. So. Does anyone know how AI started? Right, that same person is an expert, okay. Good. So AI has been around for a very long time. Um, I just want to talk about Amazon and what we did. Uh, and I think this is a crucial part of understanding why we're here today in terms of AI. In 1996, um, Amazon sold books. So not like now where we sell everything. Um, and in those days, there wasn't really AI as such as you know it now. And Amazon had one million books. And it's very difficult for a purchaser, a customer, to be able to sort through those books. And so they created something called Eyes. And Eyes was an automated search delivery engine uh, that recommends favorite authors, genres, um, your favorite titles. And it was a great way of searching through million books. So that was like the first step in the revolution of Amazon to show AI. And it, it was rudimentary because it wasn't what you think it is now. It's, it, it was very, it wasn't as robust. But what we see now is, is a change in the concept of, of, of artificial intelligence. So I want to just go through who's actually using AI right now uh, production workloads, and as you can see, there's actually Binder right in the far um, left. But there's there's quite a few. So there's Zillow, there's Netflix, um, there's Finra, there's Expedia, and where they're using these AIs is their recommendation engine. So you know when you're watching Netflix, you know you watch a show, they recommend similar titles. Well, that is artificial intelligence. That's that's understanding uh, your profile, and I'll go. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes. So AI at Amazon, and it's true what they say, you know, we are actually very, very focused on artificial intelligence. And you see this in the Amazon uh, portal where you buy products. So you've got a discovery and search. And if you actually looked how you search, it drops down keywords, it searches through the catalog of millions of products, and then it gives you recommendations based on what you've bought, your history, what you've looked at, what you've touched, and it builds up a profile about you. And that's a discrete part of the artificial intelligence where it gathers all that data, and then it creates your recommendations just for you. Then we have the Amazon fulfillment centers. Has anyone been to a fulfillment center? Right. Have you seen those robots? Right. Those robots are programmed with every single item that it, that's available on, in the UK, Amazon.co.uk. Those robots fulfill the orders. So you don't see packers walking through miles and miles of warehouse trying to fill your order. It doesn't happen that anyway. The packers are at their console. The order comes through, the robot goes off, gets the, gets the product, brings it to a location where the packet goes and gets it and it's sent to you. We're also looking at drone technology. Um, some of you may have followed some of the, the news stories in America where we're trying to use drones. We're using drones in the UK. Um, we've got a test site in Cambridge where they're actually thinking about using drones to, to deliver your products. So we're constantly innovating in terms of what we can do with our Intel intelligence. And if you look at some of the existing products that we have, we've got Alexa. Who's got an Alexa here? Who uses Alexa? Has anyone got Alexa on their phone? Smart device, okay. And so we've got Alexa. And later I'm going to talk a little bit about Lex. Lex is a little brother of Alexa, that I, I tend to call that. Um, and Lex is the back end of uh, the skill development and the processing of that data itself. And then we have 
bringing that machine learning to all of us. So if you think about it, artificial, artificial intelligence has been predominantly for scientists, right? Data scientists, it's been precursively used in universities, and it's not really available to the masses, is it, until now? Uh, we have a huge portfolio, and I want to talk about the portfolio in a few minutes, but we've, we've seemed to have democratized the availability of these AI services, so it's available to the masses. So, if you think about that technology and the advent of deep learning, why do you think it's popular today now more so than 10 years ago? Any ideas? No? No ideas? Why it's popular now? Right? Sorry? Exactly, data is the key. So when we, when we think about AI algorithms, you know, it's, they've been around for like 30, 40 years. Uh, and mathematicians probably say they've been around for you know, 60 years. Um, what makes it applicable to AWS is that we capture lots of data. So Amazon data, if you think about your shopping, the usage of our services, logging, imagine the, the terabytes of data that's generated, right? So probably even petabytes of data. So when you look at data, we've got lots of data. What do we do with that data? So data is the key, but going back to when I was talking about artificial learning, it's been around for a long time, but these algorithms have not been available to the masses. So what we've done is productionized that and made it available through the, the frameworks that we offer. Data, again, is the key. So without data, you, don't have, you can't really research information. Um, so when we look at data, we're looking at things like um, the usage of a service. Uh, deep, deep learning is very hungry. Uh, and it's really like, if you think about child, how do we learn? We learn by exposure, we learn by experiences, we learn by watching, observation, and we learn by doing. So, but all that generates data. So if you want to teach um, a, a machine learning algorithm, teach it, then you have to give it lots of data. So deep learning is a very hungry type of science where you, you, you're constantly feeding that information. Now, the other thing about advent learning is that through cloud computing, GPUs and accelerated computation is more available. Traditionally, you'd have the traditional CPUs, but now you've got the advent of GPU, GPUs, the P2 processor, for example, the C3, uh, sorry, C4 and M4. Those kind of servers weren't available on a traditional basis. So again, you know, if you think about data intelligence and how you process that data, how you create those models, inference models, it's very difficult and it was really preclude to the universities, but we've taken away that and we have now, this, because of Amazon at scale, we have that computing, uh, computation power and computers available to the masses. And then we have the program models. So there's a great, um, uh, I would say saying in terms of program models where you know, you're not really going to use the application if the models out there don't really reflect what everyone's using. So if you think about the program models we have for AI, so we've got Python, we've got R for example, um, we have um, Go, Scala, so, so Go.js. So these program models are now available on our AI services. And what we, what we thought about when we were creating these AI services is not to restrict to certain languages. We offer the languages that developers use out there on a daily basis. And this is accumulated in the service that we offer, our platform. So let's talk a little bit about our platform. Okay. So our approach to AI is made up of three layers. The first layer uh, is a collection of like, highly scalable, like pre-trained, pre-tuned, uh, managed AI services uh, that don't require a lot of previous AI or deep knowledge. Uh, to get you started. And if you look at the top tier, we, we're looking at the, the, the three services that we offer. We offer recognition, poly, and legs. Uh, so for recognition, um, it's just images and um, facial analysis. Poly specifically is for text-to-speech. Um, Amazon Lex, for example, covers conversational chatbots with automated speech and uh, natural language understanding. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more in, in a few minutes. And then you've got your AI platform across the board. And so when we look at data, we know that our customers will have custom data. So you're, not, you're going to be building out your AI or your machine learning 
uh, using our platform with your own data. So we have, we've given a capability where you can actually upload your own data, train your mo inference models, and then deploy those models out into production. And then on the bottom, you've got the AI engine. So we've got Apache Net, MXNet, which is our framework of choice, but it also supports uh, TensorFlow, TensorFlow, Cafe, Theano, Torch, Cintiq, and Keras. So let's talk a little bit about, about MXNet. Does anyone use MXNet? Nope. Does anyone know anything about MXNet? OK. So MXNet is basically, MXNet means mixed net. And it's a, it's a deep learning framework. And MXNet uses neural nets, which invoke the process of multiplying a lot of matrices. It's easy to pick up and build the deep learning modules. Now, Poly. Poly, has anyone used Poly? Who, who uses the audiobooks? Anyone use audiobooks? Right. So it's text to speech. So basically, we've made a console so easy that you can actually type in what you want to say and you listen to it and you can download it as an MP3. So Poly again is text to speech. We've got recognition. So recognition is a service for image recognition, image analysis, image detection. And then we have Lex. Now Lex is specifically used as for conversational agents and, and speech recognition. So I want to go a little bit deeper now into looking at each individual service. So let's have a look at MXNet. So in the past five years, uh, deep neural networks have solved many computational difficult problems, particularly in the field of computer vision. And because these deep networks require a lot of computational power to train, often using tens of, GP tens of thousands of GPUs, many people assume they can run them on, on powerful cloud servers. So in fact, I would say that a deep network model uh, that once has been trained needs relatively few computational resources to run and to run those predictions. So basically, this means that once you deploy a model on a lower edge, you know, a powered non-cloud device, and it could be a Raspberry Pi, for example, you can run it without relying on an internet connection. Now, with MXNet, um, you tend to see, you know, an open source framework. And it's our, it's our engine of choice because it's open source. Um, it's effective at handling a lot of the GPU training and deployment of complex models. And it's very lightweight in terms of the network neural rationalizations it can create. Oh, my click is not working. Okay, here we go. So MXNet supports many programming languages. Um, for example, C++ on the back end. But on the front end, you can convert to JavaScript, Python, R, MATLAB, Julia, Scholar, uh, and Go. Um, so irrespective of the type of language you use, you can use this MXNet to, to get and go. Uh, one of the things that's really important to note about MXNet is that it's optimized for deep learning. So this is pre-configured AMIs that are available through Marketplace. They're pre-tuned, pre-configured, and they integrate with Lambda. So that's one of the reasons why MXNet is, is our choice in terms of the frameworks that we offer. And why is it best on AWS? Because it integrates with our services. And later I'll talk a, lot, a little bit more of how it integrates, but with MXNet, uh, because it's a RESTful API, you can actually call different services. And we've got the, the provision of the GPU service, the P2 service. So if you have really large computational flows that don't really work on a C4 or M4, you can use those GPUs to reduce the timeline in terms of creating those experiments. As I remember when, when I was doing my PhD and um, I was running these computational workloads, it would take me two to three weeks. With the same GPUs, I can run my computational workloads within two to three hours uh, and develop right, deep inference models, which I wouldn't be able to complete uh, with a short time frame. So that's one of the importance of why we think it's the best for AWS. So some of the deep learning armies. So again, you can get this on, a, on Marketplace. 
Uh, we support these frameworks, uh, Linux and Ubuntu EC2 servers. These frameworks are pretty configured, as I said before, so you can get started really, really quickly. Uh, your P2 instances are powered through NVIDIA GPUs, which accelerate computations. And you can train these models in a fraction of time uh, compared to traditional CPUs. Okay, so let's talk about Poly. So Poly is a service that converts uh, text to lifelike speech. Now, it's fully managed, and we get all services that Aidus offers. We'd like to manage the service, so we take away that burden of you managing the service. It's, it's continuously improved. Um, so people have used, people have used Alexa. Um, so Poly is basically the back end of Alexa. So if you, if you speak to Alexa and she understands natural language, she's continuously improving. So Polly is, because it's a back end, you're constantly improving every time you speak to Polly. So I just want to show you a few um, examples in a few minutes, but just before we move to that point, I want to make a note that it converts text to life like speech, and it does sound very human-like, which is what we're trying to aim for. It's a fully managed service, which means that you don't manage it. There's a console, you go in, you type in what you want to convert, and you create the MP3, and you're away. Um, it's 47 lang voices, 24 languages. Uh, I'm just going to be using British language today. I don't know if, uh, um, I didn't think about using other languages, because I, I wasn't sure who would understand what. Um, and we have low latency real time. So in other words, when you type in, in the console, that text, in real time, it will create that the, that, the audio file. Uh, and so that's really important in, in terms of seeing those results immediately. Um, one of the things to note as well, uh, and I just want to point out, is that this service is, is API based. So you can store, replay, distribute general speech. Uh, it, there, there's no royalties associated with what you create, which is really important. Uh, redistribution, recording, it's free to use wherever you want, and it's built per character. Uh, converted. So let's have an example of Poly. So here it's, um, here we're talking about um, Poly, uh, talking about the weather today. Uh, and what's important to know is that the, the voice quality and pronunciation continually improves over time because it's the back end that's used for Alexa. Today so, in London it's 25 degrees Celsius. Did you all hear that? Okay, next one. So the second one is intelligible and easy to understand. So basically, that basically means that the voice I choose, you should be able to understand her and the accent. So she's going to say something in, on, in Australian. So let's see how well she does. She sells seashells by the seashore. The shells she sells are surely seashells. So if she sells shells on the seashore, I'm sure she sells seashore shells. I wouldn't even try to attempt that myself because I get all tongue-tied. Um, and so when we come to adding semantic meaning, this is really important. So Polly can distinguish between a number and a telephone number. So I've just asked Polly to, uh, to say my telephone number as a number. Today's number is 7,867,123,123. Today's number is 7,867,123,123. Right. And so I've asked Polly... To, to give it some kind of semantic meaning. I want her to reiterate my phone number. Actually, it's not really my phone number, maybe the first five digits. But I want her to reiterate what this actually sounds like. So here we go. Diana's number is 07867123123. Right. So Polly is clever enough to distinguish between a number and a telephone number. So when you create the text in Polly, you can define those parameters and how she's going to pronounce what you call. So you can tell, say it's actually a number, then she'll pronounce a number or a telephone number. It's very important that when you get to console that you add these parameters in. And um, the other thing that was important to know is customized pronunciation. So you know, my, name is, is, my name is Dina, right? Sometimes just pronounced as Dina. My son's name. My son's name is Jay. It's not really Jay, it's actually. My son's name is Jay. So. So Polly knows the difference between J and Jai, and so you can identify customized pronunciation uh, when you create your speech. 
So as a recap, it's high quality, uh, best in class in terms of deep learning. The more data you feed, the better the service becomes. Uh, it has a deep functionality in the sense that it can generate the text that you create and understands the differences of the semantic meaning. And it's built for production, it's low cost. And some of the use cases I've seen, uh, for example, are articles and blogs, we've had training material, we've had chatbots, you can integrate it with Lex to create a chatbot, and you've got public announcements um, that we've used Poly for. Next is recognition. Okay. So again, the recognition is a fully managed service. And um, this service is used to analyze images at scale, uh, integrate seamlessly with Amazon S3, Amazon Lambda, and other AWS services. So let's now take a little bit of a dive into these features and look at the API that supports these features. So here we have, uh, here we have a recognition where we, we understand and search the visual content. So first of all, it's real-time batch image analysis. So when you upload an image, it doesn't just sit there. It immediately identifies the labels associated to an image. And then it provides you with the information you need. So on the batch side, you can use the Lambda to pull in masses of images to process. Then you've got the object and scene detection. So Recognition is able to comprehend scenes, objects, concepts, faces. Uh, given an image, it will return a list of labels. And these labels could be anything from whatever artifacts you see on my face. It could be my nose, my eyes, my hair, the scene behind me. Um, and given an image of, with more than one face, it will return like bounding boxes, which we'll, I will show you in a few minutes. So here is an image of an idyllic resort, which I would really love to go to. Um, and so this image you see here, if you look at the confidence level on the, on the right-hand side, it, the confidence level is basically telling you that it thinks this is actually in the image itself. And um, so, the, so these images are showing, for example, the bay, the, bay, the beach, uh, coast. There's no hotels. So it's giving like a 51.24% uh, um, confidence level. Looking at the facial detection, so again, you know, recognition is pre-trained to identify faces. If the label is not present in the detection of wherever you upload, send us an email, we'll create a label for you. But we've got thousands of labels already pre-created to show you the difference. And so here's just an example of some of the labels that you would will, you will see associated to this image. Secondly, then you have facial recognition or facial analysis. And as you can see from this image, uh, recognition is identifying, for example, the brightness, beard, smiling, happy. It's got demographic data. It's got center express. These, all these labels already exist. So I, I urge you to give it a go where, when, you, when you get a chance to upload your images. It's actually quite fun. So some of the things about facial search, we have, we can compare two faces. So in a crowd of people, it, it, if I took a snapshot of you and my face was in the crowd, it would find my face and compare it. Uh, it will do a face search, compare many, many faces, and you can identify which faces you want it to search. And then you've got to find similar faces. So for example, um, my, uh, one of my friends looks a bit like Robert Downey. Uh, and then I, I got a picture of Robert Downey and compared the two, and it was very, very similar, but he picked him out really, really well. So again, as a recap, it's, again, best in class. And it gets better because of all the data that's uploaded. It's easy to use. It's fully managed. It's at scale. It integrates with all the services in AWS. It's peer as you go. Uh, your first 5,000 images per month for 12 months is free. So please go ahead and play. And then finally, we have Lex. So if you think about the advent of conversational agents. We, in the last 50 years, we had huge cabinet-sized machines, we had memory registers, we had punch cards. Then it came along and we evolved into becoming a little bit more simpler, a little cheaper. Second generation, we had um, sliders, interactive user interface, 
uh, pointers. And now we've got to a point where we're third generation, which basically means that we've got conversational interfaces, which where machines understand human beings. For example, Alexa, when, uh, where the machine can understand what you say. So if you ask Alexa, for example, what time is it, or what's the weather, she's gonna understand what you're saying. Um, and one of the things to remember about the, these intent oriented devices is that they're on demand, they're accessible, they're efficient, and they use natural understanding of our voice. They relate to us as human beings. And if you think about the conversation agents used in voice text, we've got texts and voice chatbots. Um, if you've ever been on our website, we have a chatbot. If you want to ask for help, we've got Alexa. Uh, Lex again powers the back end of Alexa. We've got voice interactions of mobile, webs, um, and devices. So again, you can interact with, um, with Lex through the browser as well. You've got interaction with Slack, FB Messenger, Twilio, and um, you've even got the enterprise connectors that you see on the slide. So Alexa is, comes with the ecosystem, right? Lex is single tenant. And that's the important distinction to remember between Alexa and Lex. And again, it's easy to use. Um, and you can create bots for quite a lot of things. You've got bots for consumer requests. You've got bots for news updates, weather information, gaming scores, for example. You get application bots for to booking your tickets, sorting your food, to managing bank accounts. And this is just a little uh, diagram I threw up to help you understand the integration with AWS services. So on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is the, is the customer, you, the users. And you've got your end users and your developers. And you've got input of speech to text using Poly, for example, uh, Cognito, CloudTrail, CloudWatch can be integrated. You've got the same technology that powers Alex, Alexa, the ASR, the NLU. Um, and then all that APIs are drawn into Alexa, Amazon Lex to create whatever Lambda function you want to create, to create your chatbot. So what's up next? So new APIs. So I can't really say which APIs are being re released, but this is a really hot topic for us uh, at, at Amazon Web Services. It's one of the biggest topics. Uh, and desire of our customers. And so we're always going to be bringing out new APIs. We're going to be showing the updates on our blogs. Uh, we'll be showing the innovation. And so if you have ideas about improving our service, just send us an email. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear about your, your innovation ideas and the things that we, how we can improve the service. Now, I would like to introduce you to Roland who have incorporated recognition into their platform. Roland, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Roland Kaiser. I'm the CTO of Binder. We're a Dutch startup specialized in digital asset management. I will wait a bit for the applause to go away. Um, as a true, I've been with the company since the beginning in 2013, and uh, as a true startup CTO, in the beginning, I did most of the coding myself, or at least a lot of it. I was kind of a full stack developer, so a little bit of front end, back end. Um, luckily, now I don't have to do that uh, anymore, and I'm actually glad, because um, to be honest, I'm not the best developer out there, um, especially when it comes to back end. You know, there are a lot of people way smarter than I am. Um, if I would have to build a, a, a computer program um, that was able to detect objects or facial expressions on an image, so really artificial intelligence, it would be impossible for me. Um, I don't know anything about the technology that goes behind those tools. Um, if I would have to build it, I would probably um, um, have to go back to school, and I don't really have time for that. So luckily, um, AWS released a really cool uh, service last year called Recognition. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, and tell you about uh, how we implemented that uh, in our application. Let me first tell a little bit about, uh, uh, about Binder, what it is we do. Um, we were founded in 2013 and have uh, grown a lot since then. We now have 250 employees uh, and a year-to-year -year growth percentage of 350. We have an active user base of 150,000 and our uh, users uh, uploaded uh, about 50 million assets combined. Um, last year, we managed to secure our Series A funding, which allowed us to uh, accelerate our growth even more. 
and uh, security is very important for us. Um, last year we, uh, we, we became ISO 27001 certified and we're also HIPAA compliant, which is very important for uh, pharmaceutical clients. Our main office is uh, located in Amsterdam and uh, our main tech, tech offices are in Rotterdam and, uh, and Barcelona. Um, Boston, Dubai, and of course our most beautiful office here in London are mainly uh, customer facing roles, so sales, uh, implementation, and, uh, and customer success. Um, when we started with the Binder product in 2013, we uh, actually tried to solve a problem that our first customer was facing. Binder was founded by a company called Label A, a web agency, and uh, we were working for a, a Dutch beverage company, and they had many brands, such as a uh, whiskey brand, vodka, uh, Geneva, etc. With this many brands, they had a lot of digital assets to, uh, to manage. So think about uh, uh, images for social media, product images, uh, marketing materials. They came to us uh, if, if we could uh, build a solution for that. Um, their current solution was to upload files to an FTP drive. If a supplier needed them, they would just share it on FTP. Um, or even worse, if the files were too big, they would send out a bicycle courier to deliver them. So luckily we, um, we built something um, um, that was later uh, turned out to be Binder and, um, and uh, we really made that easier for them. Now looking at the uh, explosive growth of online content uh, over the years, it makes a lot of sense that a lot of companies have this exact same problem. Um, cloud technology and AI, they can really help out here. This is where Binder comes in. Uh, we offer truly cloud-based solutions, fully hosted on the Amazon uh, Web Services platform that uh, companies of any size can use to store and manage all the digital assets, and share these with clients and employees, communicate about branding guidelines, for example, how to use a logo, what fonts you to use, um, and integrate with third-party platforms, e-commerce and, uh, and CMS. Uh, our clients include companies like Puma, Exxon Noble, and here in the UK, Aston Martin and Innocent Rings. Um, we're available on platform, all platforms, such as, uh, of course, web is our main uh, focus, but we also have uh, apps available on iOS and Android, uh, plugins available for Adobe Creative Suite, and Drupal and, uh, and Sitecore. Um, we also have SDKs and APIs available so that clients can develop their own solutions. Now let's take a look at what we do with AWS. We have a global setup, so we're hosted uh, all over uh, the world. Uh, in Australia, Japan, uh, Europe, and two in the East Coast. We also have um, um, local clusters available, so uh, that, for example, the US only cluster, the data doesn't leave that continent, and it's really important for financial companies, for example. Some of the services that we use mainly are, uh, of course, EC2 and S3, um, but also Elastic Cash, um, Route 53 for uh, DNS and failovers. So, for example, if uh, something goes on uh, or or there's an outage in the East Coast, in the US, clients automatically get switched over to the West Coast. Now, earlier this year, our customers were introduced to the first AI capabilities uh, within Binder. Um, for longer, we were thinking about how can we make our application smarter. Um, and um, um, our clients, they actually spend a lot of time uh, during the upload of their files on categorizing them, and uh, categorizing the files, tagging them, setting up taxonomies. Um, it, it's really time consuming. We do extract the metadata from the files, so uh, think about exit data or XMP, uh, but still, it's a, it's a painful process. How great would it be if we can help these users by giving them suggestions about what the image is about? Now, we were thinking about how we, can, uh, how we, how we could build this, making calculations, estimations, and then AWS um, uh, announced the recognition service. So, of course, we were really happy. It was at the end of last year, during, uh, during Christmas time, and we, um, we formed a team of sm small team of engineers that were going to work on this project. Now, of course, it was during Christmas time, so uh, th they had quite a little fun. And with, uh, with every successful internal project, it need to, needed to have a code name. Now, um, um, the team was really into, uh, into the series Westworld. Um, and, um, um, of course, uh, for those who haven't seen the series yet, go watch it. Um, and you will understand exactly why we, uh, why we chose the code name uh, Project Bernard. Um, the project was quite a success. We actually delivered it in one month, which was, uh, which was the goal when we started out. Um, because we wanted to deliver it fast and make it available to our, uh, to our customers. Now let's take a look at the solution. We wanted to keep it simple, deliver it in one month's time. Um, 
our users, they upload the images directly to S3, so it doesn't go first to EC2, for example. Um, and after that, we, uh, we automatically trigger a Lambda event. And Lambda is a really important part of this infrastructure. We'll tell a little bit more about that later. Um, the Lambda event is a function that runs in the cloud, and it calls the Re recognition API. Recognition is just a REST API. It's not really complicated, just, uh, just a REST call, and uh, you'll get the results. Um, after that, the results are stored in the internal uh, binary API. And um, um, for identification, to keep everything securely in that process, we use Amazon KMS. Now, Lambda, like I said, is a very important part here. It's uh, serverless computing. And um, um, it's basically running functions in the cloud without any additional infrastructure. Um, and this can be as simple as just writing a, um, um, a Python script or Node.js script, uploading it to the Lambda interface, and then it's available to be triggered by, for example, S3 events or uh, DynamoDB or uh, API gateways. And it's really, really cool to experiment with this. Uh, we had a one-month uh, um, time frame to deliver this feature, and Lambda was a, was a big part of the success because um, um, it was really fast to have something in the cloud, not have to worry about the infrastructure, about uh, setting up other scaling groups, health checks. Um, it's, um, it's, it's really high available and uh, scalable out of the box. Um, the recognition is request itself, like I said, it's really simple. Just a JSON string, JSON object that you can send uh, to the REST API. Um, you send it to Bucket. Um, of course, it's an example. You send it to file name and what attributes you want to return. Do the, um, do the REST call, and these results are returned. Um, now, for the skateboard and sport labels, it's pretty confident. It has about 100% score, and, well, it's right. Um, for apartment building and freeway, however, we're, he's not so sure, so he's about 50%. In our application, when we uh, display the results, we only uh, show results that are about 75% uh, and higher. And this uh, seems to be the, seems to be the, right, uh, the right fit. So far, the um, application has been running really smoothly. We now analyze about 60K images per day uh, without any problems. Um, and the important part is that we actually made a deadline. We had a time to market of one month. If you compare that with the time that we estimated um, um, to build this ourselves, it was about a year. So this is not only the, um, the time it would take to develop a feature, but also to train the model and make it return actual relevant results. And even if we would have done it, it would have never given us the quality that Amazon can, can offer us, because it has all the knowledge uh, that, that's been built up over the years with, uh, with the retail website, for example. Um, we're currently working on facial uh, recognition. So, for example, if it recognizes somebody in the picture, um, you can automatically uh, click through and see more of this, uh, this person. For that, uh, it would be great to show uh, the product video that we made and that you can actually see um, um, yeah, how the feature works and, um, and, uh, and knowing how easy it was to implement. Um, it, this is really interesting. Research has shown us that 68% of companies are adding new product images to their websites every week. Yet it takes a large portion of companies more than a day to upload and categorize the new content. Imagine if you could simply upload any digital media into your brand portal and that it would be searchable, accessible, and easy to find and use it across any channel. Finder, the global leader in digital asset management software is embedding AI capabilities into its platform to automate and streamline the processes around your digital media. Whether you're uploading two or 2,000 images, Binder will scan objects and automatically attach matching keywords with accuracy levels that ensure that assets are provided with the most relevant tag. With its deep learning capabilities, your brand portal will become more intelligent over time constantly enriching asset information so that you don't have to. Imagine that maintaining your taxonomy becomes irrelevant. The future of digital asset management is now a reality. Say hello to a smarter way of working.
So to, uh, to wrap it up, um, this project was, uh, was a huge success for us. Um, our team had a lot of fun uh, developing the feature and we were able to release it uh, within uh, uh, much before the deadline. This, is, this, this project is also really indicating for the relationship that we have with AWS because they allow us to focus on the things that we like to do. We like to um, build cool features for our end users, for our customers. We don't want to worry about you know, setting, setting up infrastructures, um, reinventing the wheel by uh, training our own AI model. Um, we joined the partner program in 2014 and we're now an enterprise support customer. So we have a lot of um, um, direct access to resources within Amazon. Um, um, we have regular meetings with account managers at our office so that we can ask all our uh, technical questions. And um, um, one extra benefit is that we get um, um, early access to the beta program of the new services that are announced. So hopefully uh, next year I'll be here again uh, speaking about one of the new services that are announced. Um, so thank you all for, um, uh, for listening to my talk. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be here after uh, in the front of the hall and otherwise in the expo hall. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roland. So we have a little bit of help as well you know, if you want to get started. So again, uh, please remember that there's a free tier to use these services, so you, you, you won't be out of pocket. Um, have a look at our blog. Our blog are constantly updated. Have a look at some of the documentation that's out there. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, cloud front formation templates on GitHub as well, and the links are actually on the website as well. So if you really want to get deep dive into using AI, some of our machine learning or poly or recognition Lex, those templates are available for you, so you don't have to do all the hard work uh, at the beginning. So before I leave, any questions? Right, yes. I'm sorry, I caught here. Can recognition? So, uh, can you actually take an audio file yeah. or a video and uh, bring it to right, right now, recognition only only can for JPEGs and PNG files at the moment. Yes, that's the only thing you can do right now. But it's not to say it's not coming. You can you. You can create an inference model based on that. So you can use machine learning, create an inference model based on audio files or uh, images that you would see in a video, for example, target that and get recognition to identify that face. So it's a mixture of using MXNet, deep learning, and recognition as well. Okay, okay. Yes. Well that, well, that depends on your use case, isn't it, right? But if you've got a use case where you want to detect an image, a face, you've got to detect um, a face API. So when I, when I talk about recognition APIs, there's quite several of them. There's one face analysis, there's one for face detection, for example. So it just depends on the type of model you create. Right, okay. Right. Yep. So, yes, you can. It, and it, any image can you create a label, right? And if you create a label, it recognizes that image. If the label doesn't exist in our repository, then let us know, and we'll create it for you and upload it, right? Yes. You can come and talk to me afterwards. Yeah. Transcription is poly. Text to speech. Speech to text is. Let them do that too in natural language. Yes, you can do. If if you create uh, if you create a, a, a bot, uh, an agent that can as an input of audio, then it, you can convert speech to text as opposed to poly that does text to speech. Is that yeah? Okay. Yes, you can recognize animals. Yes, you can. So one of the things, yes, one of the things about uh, recognition is that you've got the um, facial analysis, or facial dec 
Detection API. And depending on the label that you create, right, uh, and the type of model you create, you can tell the difference between a cat that's a tabby cat or a cat that's got black fur. So you can, you can the, ver the, the variations are very subtle as well. Depending on how you train the neural net, remember it's about the amount of data you push through. The, I mean, and deep learning is very hungry. The more data you give it, the more accurate your neural net will be, the more accurate your results will be. So the recognition services, so when we talk about managed services, we're talking about the service that we manage, AWS for example, and your experiences, your observations, your learning, the data that you upload, all that contributes on the service that we create. Uh, the more data you provide us, the better the service is. So for example, with Polly, uh, if you can't, you'd be continuously uploading data and you're continuously trying to convert text to speech, we're looking at different voices. So right now we've got 47 right, voices um, and 24 languages and we're gonna continue to increase the number of language offerings we have based on what our customers tell us to do. So we're a very customer oriented company. If there's something that's missing, you have to email, email customer support and say, you know, I would like this language uh, offered in Poly. Then eventually we'll get to the point where you, you will get that. Uh, but your question is about, does the services improve over time? Yes, no, it's not regional. All our services are hosted globally as well. So if you think about the APIs, they're all APIs, right? So they're not just region specific. When we, when we uh, create a new service, right, and promote that service, it's on a global level, right? It's just not in a region level. We don't do that, right? What you're thinking about is probably is when we release services. Sometimes those, those services are released in certain regions. That's deliberate because we want to see how well they, they do before we start spanning out geographically. Right, so you've got the compare API, so you've got two faces. And so when you, when you scan the first image and the second image, it'll detect the differential between the two. You can also create labels of what you want to look for. So if you look for brown eyes, as opposed to blue eyes. If you want to look for a mole on your face and it's not there. If you want to look for a beard on one face, it's not there. You can create your inference model first, right, by, by providing that data, creating those labels, extremely important. And then the API will compare the two, right? So that's the groundwork, you've you got to do the groundwork first before it starts giving you the, the information that you think you want. The confidence levels goes up depending on the labels that you identify. So you can create the labels, say for example, blue eyes to brown eyes, black hair to dark, uh, to your know, blonde hair for example. The standard label, exactly, the standard labels have been created, but the labels that you want don't exist, uh, which I haven't really found that yet to be honest. Uh, then again, email us because we, we say that if, if the labels are not there, let us know and we'll create them for you. Okay, okay thank you very much. <laughs>